Well, here's the main idea from Psalm 103. You ready? Here's the big idea, all those verses, all that stuff we just read. It's bless the Lord. (laughs) Bless the Lord. Let's say that together. Ready? Bless the Lord. That's the big idea today. And uh, it's not rocket science. I like that. Some people like me, we need it uh, pretty simple sometimes. Let's bless the Lord. Now, what does that mean? Let's, let's take that apart. First of all, uh, what does bless mean? Have you guys ever heard anybody say the word bless in, in life? And uh, I, I, there's a couple of times that I, I can think of maybe where I've heard that before. One, I think of a sweet old little lady, and, and she's saying to some kid, like, oh, bless your heart. I think of that. Um, or I think of in the South, nothing against those in the South, okay? But, but this is kind of something you'll hear more there than here, and that is... Um, basically, it's when someone's upset with someone or disagrees with someone, they feel like they need to attach, well, now, now bless their heart or bless their soul, but, and then they like, you know, let the negative thing come out. Like, they feel like it's got to be attached to it. It's like a Christian way to be upset. Uh, but those are the kind of, some of the ideas I think of when we use the word bless. Now, um, here's the, the Hebrew word, and here's what this bless means, as we kept hearing that in the beginning of the psalm and to the end of the psalm. Bless from, comes from uh, Kodesh. Kodesh in Hebrew, and it it means something like this, to glorify or to attribute unique divine worth or honor. I'm going to say that again. It means to glorify or to attribute unique divine worth or honor. And so in a layman's terms, in in my own words, basically means you're awesome. It's to tell someone you are awesome. Bless you, you are awesome. I thought maybe we could just apply this to our life right now. Turn to the person you came to church with today and say, bless you, you are awesome. (laughs) Awesome. See, now you're like, I'm so glad I went to church today. I got built up. And you know what? And it's true. It is true. You are awesome. The Lord has made you wonderfully and fearfully. Literally last night, I was having this conversation with my three kids. I love my kids so much, but once in a while, and those of you that are parents and you you have multiple kids, you know what I'm talking about, where you bless one, you tell them they're awesome in some unique way, and then another kid goes, well, but what about me? And so then you're like over here and you're blessing them, you're trying to tell them how cool they are. And we had this whole talk last night as we were going to bed that you are all fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen to that. Bless you in that way. But this word Kodesh is is different than us telling other people something like that. It is actually something we only tell God is to say, God, you are awesome in ways that only God can be awesome is, is what this is. Kodesh, bless you. You are God. We are not. You are awesome as God can only be kind of thing. Now, who exactly then is to bless the Lord? And we're going to see that in the beginning of the psalm and the end of the psalm. It's kind of like bookmarks uh, to what's then the content in the middle. So let's find out who is to bless the Lord. Verse 1, look at it for yourself in the Bible. It says, of David, again, the saying that David, King David is the one who wrote this. And he says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. He's saying, myself. And really what he's saying is mankind, we as human beings, you and I, we are called to bless the Lord, to tell him how awesome he is. And, 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 and did you catch, is this a superficial afterthought kind of thing? No, this is all my soul, all that is within me, from the depths of my soul and my heart, I am to tell the Lord how awesome he is, to bless him. And so all of us have been called to do it from the depths of our hearts. He goes on, verse 2, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his, all his benefits. And uh, we're going to break all those out in just a bit, but let's jump to the end, the other bookend on uh, verse 20, and find out there's some others, though, who have, who have been called to bless the Lord. Verse 20, bless the Lord, O you, his, help me out, harvest, his what? Angels. You see that? His angels. You mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Those are all different ways to say angels. 
And maybe you don't know this, but God created the heavens and the earth, and God created human beings and, and animals that we can see, and insects and, and plants and, and all of that, but he also created another kind of being called angels. And then there were certain angels that fell, and we call those demons. And that's, but there's, there's all these beings that are out there that we can't usually see. They're usually invisible. Sometimes they can take human form or physical form, and we can see them at times throughout history. But all of these beings also, uh, David is saying, you too, bless the Lord. And uh, there are myriads of angels around the throne of God. And he's saying, and they already are doing this, but he's saying, hey guys, let's all bless the Lord and tell God how awesome he is. And there's actually one more than category that he goes on in verse 22, who should bless the Lord? He says, bless the Lord, all his works and all his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. In other words, he just, he starts with humans and then he goes to angels, and he's like, you know what? Let's just, let's everything and everyone, all of creation. Why? Because God is worthy of it. And I love that last song we just sang there right before coming up here. It's like, Lord, you are worthy. You are worthy. Humans, people, worship him. He is worthy. Bless him. Angels, bless him. All of creation, bless him. Every man, woman, child, angel, and created thing. Now, Let's, now that we understand what it means to bless the Lord, to tell him how awesome he is, all of us are called to do it, here's five reasons. Five reasons that we should want to, with all that is within us, bless him. The first one is this. Bless the Lord, he forgives and restores. He forgives and restores. And now honestly, we're gonna spend more time on this one than some of the other five because David spends more time on this one more than the other five. And, uh, and it's so good though. God is in verse three, the one who forgives all your iniquity. What's iniquity? It's another fancy word for sin. It's more than mistakes, it's sin. You say, well, which sins does God forgive? All of them, Amen. all of them. And then he goes on, he says, who heals all your diseases? We're gonna come back to that one, okay? That's a different point. But then he goes back to this idea of forgiveness and restoration in verse four. God is the one who redeems your life from the pit. Now he has a picture for us, doesn't he? Have you guys, I want you to picture a pit that is so deep that if something gets in it, it can't get out of it by itself. Uh, I was actually able to go to Israel not too long ago, and I was able to see when you go to places around the world that have more rocky soil and areas, there are natural pits and crevices all over the place. And what David has in mind is a kind where you would look in, inside of it and see skeletons. Because whether animals or even people might get in there, and if they can't get help, they are stuck there literally till they die. I moved in our house not too many years ago, and, and during that first year there, I remember smelling something on the side of my house. And I walked over as the windowsill part that goes down to the basement, and I looked in, and there was a rotting rabbit carcass, I think is a rabbit. <laughs> Whatever it was, it got in there, and it was too high for it to get out. See, that's the image that David has of a pit like that. Now, what he is saying is this. There is, when, when we sin, there is a spiritual pit that we fall in. Outside of the pit is God's blessing and his intimacy and his goodness and all the things that come from being close to God. But inside that pit is nothing but death and destruction and nothing good for us. And, and that sin in that pit is so deep and heavy, we cannot get out of it by ourselves. But God, Amen. God loved us so much that 2,000 years ago, not only did he get at the top of the pit and reach down, but he lowered his own son, Jesus, into the pit with us and helped us to make it so we can get out with his help. Amen. You see what the imagery of what he has? And see, when we get out of that pit by receiving his forgiveness, he also restores us back in full restitution with the Lord and reconciliation. That's the image that David has. Let's go on. We're going to see this now. He goes on. He says, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you 
with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. I want to highlight the satisfaction concept here. How many of us, you're listening right now, and you, if you're honest, you're saying, I, I can't say that I'm satisfied in life. I can't say that I'm content in the depth of my soul. I feel like I'm missing something. And, and maybe you're trying to fulfill this emptiness inside of you with other things, good or bad, doesn't matter, legal or Ill- illegal, whatever it might be. But you're trying to satisfy something in your depths of your soul that you're not finding. What David is saying here is that ultimate true satisfaction is found through the forgiveness that you find in Jesus Christ and his restoration of you with himself. That's what he's saying. Verse 8, he says, the Lord is merciful and gracious. He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide. Chide is another word for discipline or rebuke. Nor will he keep his anger forever. Let me say this. See, this is talking about those of us that are Christians, those of us who have repented of our sin and received his forgiveness and he's pulled us out of the pit, right? And, and so this is speaking to us. And what he is saying is that you are my children and as a loving father, I discipline you. And remember, we've talked about this in some of the Psalms throughout the summer here. And this principle comes out often. And, and what he's saying is, I, I'll discipline you because I love you and I want you to thrive in that area of your life. And I want you and me to have a close relationship. But what he's saying, is I'm not going to do it forever because you're my child. You know, there's a purpose and there's a time for it, but that's not forever. Loved ones as Christians, that's awesome. But let me say this, this is not speaking about non-Christians. There's a world of a difference between how God works in this way. The Bible says that if we have not given our life to Christ, instead of being a child of God, we are an enemy of God. And that what we have coming in our future, unless we change that through Jesus Christ, is eternal death. Forever, wrath of God for what we deserve for our sins. And so I'll just say it again. If you have yet to give your life to Jesus Christ and ask him to forgive you of your sins, don't wait. Don't wait. Give him your life today. Give him your life today. But for those of us that are children of God, praise God. He, he will end the discipline that he lovingly puts on our lives. Praise God. Let's read on, look at verse 10. We're still, we're still pondering here the idea that he forgives and restores. Verse 10, he does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Can I get an amen in the house on that one? Amen. Right? Praise the Lord. He does not give me what I deserve. Amen. And I'm gonna say this, if you can't say authentically amen to that, then in love, I want to tell you this, you don't understand your sin. Every one of us are sinful. Every one of us needs to understand that sin is so bad, it took God the Son to die on a cross to fix it. You see? But when we have come to a relationship with Jesus, guess what? God doesn't give us what we deserve anymore. He forgives and he restores. And there's one more line then on this point, and this is so good. And maybe you've heard of this verse before. It's kind of familiar. He says, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. So now here's another picture that he has in mind as far as from the east is from the west. I I think I have a globe up on the screen here and getting this idea that we've come up with north, south, east, west. Now, I don't know if God in his sovereignty purposely planned this out that when mankind would come up with these directionals about the world that we live in, if this is what he, he was setting it up for this, I don't know. But I just think this is really, really cool. Why doesn't God say, as far as the north is from the south, will he remove our transgressions from us? Because if you're traveling north, are you always going to be traveling north? Eventually, you're going to be traveling south and vice versa. But if you're traveling east, is, will that ever end? 
Never. If you're traveling west, will that ever end? Never. God knows what he's saying. And what he is saying to you and me is this. I don't care how bad that sin is. I know you might think it's beyond my forgiveness. I know you might think there's no way that it could ever ultimately be forgotten and removed forever. But I'm telling you, if you give it to me, if you repent of it, I will forgive it, I will forget it forever. Amen Amen to that. You see, guys, we should bless the Lord because he forgives and he restores. Amen to that. Amen to that. Here's another reason why. This is going to go a little bit quicker now. Uh, Bless the Lord. Why? Because he heals. He heals. You say, where do I get that from? Verse 3, remember I told you we'd come back to that. First of all, he says, uh, who forgives all our iniquity. But then he says this, who heals all your diseases. He kind of like tucks this benefit in there, this reason then why we should bless the Lord. Now, what what diseases does God really heal? Let's be honest here. Well, um, I don't know if you guys know this, but Jesus is God. So I say we, we look at what Jesus did. What did Jesus do when he was here? He healed the leprosy. He healed palsy. He healed blindness from birth. And a lot of these, he did it multiple times. Um, he healed lameness, internal bleeding, dropsy, deadly fever. And then I love Luke 4. It just says he healed all kinds of sicknesses. Like, like he, he, he healed all sorts of stuff. In fact, there's nothing that we know of in the scriptures for sure that came and Jesus is like, I can't, I can't heal that one. I'm sorry, guys. Like that, that one, that genetic mutation was just a little bit beyond my reach. I, I love that. It was like nothing was too big for him. But then there was, there was this other one that he did, and it was kind of a big deal, and he did it a few times. Um, he healed, a, oh, that's right, death. <laughs> right? And he did it multiple times to multiple people. If he can heal death, trust me, he can, he can heal whatever it is that you and I physically are dealing with. You see, God can heal any and every disease that has or ever will exist in this world because he is the great physician. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to be careful, though, that we understand this. When we talk about God healing physical things, there are some false messages out there in the name of Christ, and that is this, that God always heals your diseases. That is not in the Bible. What is in the Bible is God can, and he can heal any, and he, he may but he doesn't always. So I don't know if you know, but I'm deaf in my right ear, completely. Born that way, it's a dead ear, they say. All the parts are there, nothing's working, that kind of thing, right? And I've grown up in the church, so I I have prayed throughout my life for God to heal it, and I believe with all of my heart, and I know he can. It's not a problem for him, but I've been praying for that, and I've done all the things that the Bible says to do. I've had... uh, I've had people praying tongues over me. I'm in, you know, in prayer. I've had, um, uh, I've had the pastors of the church come and, and anoint me and pray for healing and all these things multiple times. And I continue to pray and ask for the Lord to heal me. And it might be that before I leave this world, he will heal me. But here's the thing. For those of us that are God's children, there is a promise that he will heal every disease once and for all. If it's not here, It's in our afterlife. When we get to heaven, all the physical stuff will be gone. And I'll tell you what, I can't wait for the day. If he doesn't heal me before then, that's going to be an amazing first day of heaven for me for a lot of reasons. But one of them is going to be, what? I can actually hear you. It's going to be awesome. All right? Now, why do I say that? Because, again, we got to have a healthy, biblical, balanced view of this. Now, I want to share, though, Because God deserves the worship and glory for it of just one of multiple physical healings that I have seen or experienced in my life. But I want to say this with sensitivity because I also know that there are going to be some that you've been in the same boat that I have in this situation and God chose not to do a healing. And I want to remind us that God always has his glory and our good in the ultimate thing in his mind. Okay? Okay? But here's one thing that God chose to do, and he didn't have to, but he deserves glory. Holly and I, we we got pregnant with our our first child, 
And uh, we were ready in the time of the pregnancy to go and have the uh, doctor appointment where the heartbeat is to be heard and the measurement of the child is to be there and all of this kind of thing. And, uh, and we got there and, and there were, um, the, the heartbeat was not heard. The measurement was way beyond below what it should be. And um, there were some other things I'll leave out, but basically in all scientific medical reasons, the doctor said, she said, your child probably passed away already. And, and she said, at this point, most doctors would just immediately remove the baby right now. But this doctor was a believer, and uh, she rolled her stool up with us in the office there as we're just processing this. And she said, let's pray for the Lord that if he so chooses to do a miracle and basically resurrect this baby, uh, let's pray for that. And then we're going to give the Lord a week of prayer and fasting and see what happens. My son. Every day of my life when I see him, God heals. It's no question to me. Again, I want to be sensitive because I know that God has not said that and done that to everybody's lives, okay? But here's the thing. God can heal and he does and praise God when he does. But again, when we are his child, healing will come someday. And praise the Lord for that. He is worthy to be blessed for that. Here's another reason to bless the Lord. He brings justice. He brings justice. Look at verse six. The Lord, Yahweh, whenever it's capitalized, I say this all the time, I want us to hear that. It's Yahweh, is what he's saying, works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. Now, I know if some of you have been following with us in the sermons that you know that we just talked about justice even just last week in Psalm 25. And so if you missed that sermon, I encourage you to get on our website, harvestdemoin.org, and listen to that um, because uh, we spent a lot more time talking about this idea that God brings justice for those of us that have been wrong. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but let me just give you the bottom line of what this is. If you have been wronged by anyone at any point in your life and have not had justice served rightly to you, here's what God first says to do in other parts of scripture, forgive those people. Forgive those people. Don't let bitterness grow. But then after that, have a hope and believe that Jesus will ultimately bring justice on that great and terrible day called Judgment Day at the end of the world. Every wrong that has happened in your life will be made right. And that is another reason that we should want to bless the Lord. He brings justice. Here's a fourth reason we should bless the Lord is because he's patient. He's patient. Verse eight, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger. Right now, a lot of you have a uh, sloth in your mind from that one movie, that kid movie, right? That was one of the best parts right there. <laughs> The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You know, I, I think of, unfortunately, it's a lot of people in, in society, and they picture God like this. This is his throne, and I'm going to play God. Please forgive me. <laughs> and I'm mad. I can't even do this with a mad. Like, I'm, I'm angry. I'm always just angry. You. Yeah. Are you, ah, you wait, but oh, buddy, you have no idea what's coming. You don't mess up. I can't wait for you to mess up. Don't you mess up. Wait, I think, I think you're thinking about speed. No, I hope you speed because I'm going to stick it to you and make you wish you never existed, right? I mean, some people think that God is some, some angry God and, and just always looking to just give it to us at the first moment that we do anything. That's not the God of the Bible, That is not the God of the Bible. God is slow to anger. Now, let me make sure we're clear. Does God tolerate sin? Help me out, Harvest. No. 
God doesn't tolerate sin. In fact, to tolerate sin, get this, is actually sin in and of itself. I'm going to say that again. That, that's not said in churches enough at all. Um, I will. And uh, <laughs> amen to that. All right. To actually tolerate sin is sin in and of itself. You say, where do I get that from? Read, uh, I forget which church it is in Revelation, the seven churches, that one of the churches got, Jesus says to the church, he says, I will, I will close your doors, snuffing out candle imagery, if you don't stop tolerating this sin that's going on in your church. They weren't even doing the sin themselves. They were tolerating the sin. And he says, I was gonna shut your doors. And actually history, if I remember right, actually, sadly, they didn't get the message and that church no longer exists. So here's the point. God doesn't tolerate sin, okay? He doesn't tolerate sin, but he is patient, okay? He is patient and he's slow to anger and he's patient to to work with us and he's not gonna tolerate sin, but he's like, come on, child, come on, daughter. Why are you doing this thing? Come on, and and again, I'll discipline, I'm disciplining you in love because I'm trying to help you to correct you to stop doing that thing and daughter and and son and he's patient with us and, and that is amazing when you think about it. I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful God has been patient with me so many times in my life and he is. And so praise the Lord for that. That's another reason we should wanna bless the Lord. Now, here's our final reason to bless the Lord that we see in Psalm chapter 103. Bless the Lord, why? Because he is abounding in everlasting love. God is abounding in everlasting love. Verse eight, this comes out. The Lord is merciful and gracious. He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great as uh, is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. Let me ask you this. Uh, does anybody know the, the amount of miles that it is from the floor here to the top of the heavens? Nobody knows. Because why? Because it's just so far. We have not measured that yet. And I don't even know if there is a measurement for it. We don't know. Uh, what God is saying is, my love for you is measureless. Like there's no end to it. That's how much I love you, child. Verse 13. Oh, I'm sorry. Even before that, let's not miss this part. Did you notice also, again, who is it that his love is measureless for? At the end, those who what? Fear him. You guys remember some past Psalms that we've talked about? Fear in the Lord. You're gonna see that come out more and more here. Now, look at verse 13. As a father, uh, another image here, as a father shows compassion for his children, So the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. He's drawn on an illustration that for most of us, praise God, we had good fathers. We don't have to use too much of our imagination. But what he's saying is this, imagine the perfect father. And that's the kind of love and compassion that I have for you. Verse 14, for he, God, knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As as for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field and for the wind passes over it and it's gone and its place knows it no more. What he's saying is, uh, uh, is that human beings are nothing compared to God. Okay, this is one of those points when it's good, when you, you, uh, you, you're torn down to be built back up, okay? You and I are nothing compared to God. That's what David is reminding us of. Like the ant that you stepped on between the car and and the sidewalk parking lot and coming into here. And right now you're saying, what are you you talking about? I stepped on an ant and I'm like, yeah, that's my point. (laughs) You don't even know it. You killed an ant and it's nothing compared to you. God is saying, and what God tells us is that in value, in the sense of, of he's God, we are creatures. We are nothing compared to God. And he's helping us have a humble view of ourselves. Are you guys ready? Verse 17 though, but even though you are nothing compared to God, but the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. His love for us is abounding in everlasting love. When we don't deserve it, we are nothing compared to him. It has no end. 
We have no end, and we have a hard time understanding that sometimes. I think, I think one of the reasons why we have a hard time understanding it is because of our view of love and our acting out of love in our own relationships. Okay? We're in church, so let's be honest for a minute. And um, I think of this idea of a fling kind of love. So if you ever in elementary, junior high, high school, maybe had a fling boyfriend-girlfriend relationship that lasted maybe no more than a month, maybe just weeks. Anybody with me on that? Am I the only one? Ah, oh, there we go, right? And in that week of your boyfriend-girlfriend relationship that you're like, I love you. I love you. You are the best thing on the planet. And then a week later, you've moved on already, <laughs> right? And uh, just recently, actually, um, my brother-in-law was t- talking with me. And he's like, hey, I I've, I've saw this one classmate of mine growing up, elementary, junior high, high school. <laughs> and I was talking with her. And she said, yeah, 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 Ryan. Ryan and I were boyfriend, girlfriend. And as he's sharing it with me, I'm like, I'm sorry. I forgot that completely. I was like, a, I'm a bad fling boyfriend. I, I don't even remember the relationship. It was so short. I don't know. But um, it doesn't matter because I got an amazing wife. And I am so thankful for her. But I think of this idea of flings, I think of this idea of temporary love and as humans and our ability to love and how short-lived it can be. Okay, so let's take some other relationships, maybe, maybe where we did love someone for a matter of years even. And for whatever those reasons are, maybe our love wanes off, it uh, falls off, it grows cold and grows distant and whatever that is. See, sometimes we have an idea, it's kind of hard for us to imagine that someone could love us without end, no matter what. See, what God is saying to you and me is this, son, daughter, a million years from now, it's a long time, I'm still going to love you from the depths of my being. And, And you know what? I'm not going to move away from you because sometimes that's how love, you know, just distance and things like that. I'm not, I'm not going to move away from you. I'm not going to grow distant from you. In fact, get this, guys. Right now, God is building a house with a room for you and I. Why? So we can live with him forever. Amen. Bless, Bless the, Lord, the Lord. For he is abounding in everlasting love. Church, we have so many reasons to bless him, don't we? 